which are not related to states. And I will show a map at the end which shows the states and it shows all the fertility, how it's distributed along the states. But here we have three geological basins that have been made from north to south, the Obia, Kareol, and Yubalami Basin. And they are based on gravity anomalies first, these low gravity anomalies, <coughs> but of course we have confirmed them with our seismic because we can actually see these basins with our seismic. I'm going to start in the north. I'm going to start in the basin in the north. This is one of our beautiful seismic lines in the north. And this is actually a PSDM line, 190 kilometers. And one of the surprises that came with interpreting this data is that gravity modeling, because we integrated gravity, we integrated all, all the data that we had available, is predicting that we have a continental cross block that extends up to 200 kilometers offshore. So we have all those points of fault blocks that we can see on our seismic to confirm what the gravity modeling assumption is also telling us. And did you see where we marked S? That would be the Karoo source rock. So now I'm taking you to the pre-RIF, thermal triads, <coughs> we've already identified, we have the right conditions for source rock deposition. And here, colored in brown, are where we expect to see the source rock, because we see those characteristics. If we move up the stratigraphic column, We've now drifted Madagascar away from Somalia. And we have this shallow marine restrictive conditions. And so we would expect that in the cindery path gravels, we would see the source rocks. And there you can see in that sort of browny color, orangey color, S for source rock, so a shallower source rock. So we're moving up the stratigraphic column, we have identified two potential source rock sequences. What lies about these source rock sequences? We do have one whale. We have integrated all the whale data that we had in Somalia. This one whale uh, was drilled offshore, the Mareg one whale. And what it does is it provides us some information that we do have carbonates up on the shell. And when you take this carbonates, this carbonate sequence, you can see how this carbonate sequence continues into <coughs> the outboard. And there where you see that red line, that is actually a carbonate buildup. But this is a dip line. So carbonate buildups are not very clear on dip lines. I'm going to show you the intersecting lines so you can see how we actually came up with the conclusion that that was a carbonate buildup. This is the intersecting line. This is a strike line. Now you can see this really interesting, very, very extensive carbonate buildup complex that is just above the breakup on conformity. So the great news here is I have just shown you that we have a couple of source rock sequences, and we are very confident that those source rocks are going to be in play. And look at where the source rock sits, right below this carbonate complex. That is great news for that carbonate complex. I'm gonna show you a bit more on that. I'm also gonna show you the uh, resource evaluation that we have carried on that particular carbonate complex. But you can also see that overlying it is this sort of opaque sequence overlying that blue carbonate buildup. That is probably acting as a seal. We have the perfect play system here, and I will show you the resources associated with that and some of the de-risking that we have done. You shouldn't blind, blindly believe that that is a carbonate, <coughs> but I will show you more of it. And what happens outward of this carbonate? There is a very interesting sequence. If you follow that same sequence outward, you see this sort of low frequency, opaque sequence that we have interpreted as deep marine sacropels. We have proposed that those are deep marine sacropels. But this is a really big question. Is this a valid source rock? Do we have a way of, do I have a way of convincing you that this is a valid source rock? And I think we do. In 2011, Lothar et al., a group of Equinor, well, then Statoil employees, published this amazing paper that has changed the way we work in spectrum. And the question, it was a very simple question. Can hydrocarbon source rock be identified on seismic data? And it's a very fair question because we have, as an industry, really focused on just looking at the reservoir and identifying the reservoir and looking for amplitude anomalies associated with the reservoir, which is very fair because after all we want accumulations. But seismic data holds amazing clues and a lot of information on the source rock. And why is that? Because a source rock with kerogen will have a 
reduction in velocity and density. And what does that mean? A contrast in acoustic impedance. Whatever lithology is overlying the shale will always show you a decrease in acoustic impedance, a high amplitude anomaly. And because the shales and micas are aligned horizontally, you will get an increase in the velocity in the horizontal direction. That gives you an isotropy. So for those of geophysicists in the room, that's an ABO type 4 anomaly dimming in the far angle stack. Two key indicators, two key criteria that if we find them, we can be pretty certain that we have a source rock. This was tested in the North Sea with a Kimmerich clay, a world class source rock. We tested it in Namibia because we have up to 12 wells that have encountered the Afghan source rock. Three built by HRT in the deeper water. You may notice a sort of uh, low amplitude, low frequency, transparent sequence there, which may have, which looks a little bit similar to the one I showed you in Somalia. That is the Afghan source rock that has been drilled by wells. And here are all the criteria working in Namibia. So we used Namibia as a test, as a proof of concept before we went to Somalia. If I came to Somalia and I showed you, oh, we carried this out of Somalia, you'd probably say to be wells, but you don't have any wells. How do you know that what worked in the North Sea is going to work in Somalia? But we went to Namibia, proved the concept, it works there, you've got the low frequency zone, you've got all the criteria, and then we came to Somalia. That um, <coughs> that I showed you that would be equivalent to the Orondal source rock, that mid Jurassic source rock, or late Jurassic source rock, sorry, has the, meets the criteria. Look at the top of the source rock. The top of the source rock is a reduction in acoustic impedance. This is SEG negative um, polarity, so a black is a peak, it's a soft kick, sorry to confuse those who use American polarity. And you see at the base, we have the expected response. It's an increase in acoustic impedance. You, you see that, so it meets the first criteria. Now we look at the amplitude with variation with angle. So that's the near angle stack on your left, that's the far angle stack on your right, and you see the arrows are pointing <coughs> to the source rock, and you see how the amplitude dims in the far angle stack. So this is just by sight, but I'm gonna show you we, do, we have done our full, complete ABO analysis. And you can see there that you've got the background and you've got this very clear trend right here, which is the source rock, and that's your ABO type four anomaly. So two of the criteria have been met. This is looking like a very good quality source rock. Because you need good quality, you need keratin in the source rock, otherwise you don't get this response. And then the third, what a really interesting one, again from the LOSIF paper, is that a change in amplitude will actually indicate a change in TOC. And look at this, this is great, because you've got lower amplitude in, in the shallower, in the relatively shallower um, section. And when you get into the deeper section, which is where you would expect a higher source of accumulation and higher organic content, you've got higher amplitude. So that fits in perfectly with what we would expect. So it seems to be a good indicator also of where is <coughs> And look at the frequency. The frequency is also a low frequency zone. We have a source rock here that is meeting all the criteria that has been proven in the North Sea and in Namibia, and it also makes sense. So we believe that we have a very strong case for some very good source rocks. So what we did is, in collaboration with Leeds University, <coughs> we carried out a very detailed basin modeling. Now this basin modeling, I haven't shown you everything we've done in, in, in Somalia, but we have actually looked at cross-cell architecture, have divided up the, 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 whole sec, the whole of the basin, and um, sorry, the offshore, into different cross-cell architectures, and we have taken those into account, and we have looked at sediment overburden, we've done basin modeling through time. Here, for a couple of source rocks, source rocks, pre-rich and syn-rich source rocks, and we are not using shell colors, we are using normal standard colors. So green <coughs> is oil. And look at both, both of the source rocks are giving us oil in the north, because that's the old burden that we have. And this is calibrated with well data that we have. So we did take into account the geothermal gradients from the well data. Both of these source rocks should be generating oil. And the one that I just showed you is exactly above the thin rig, so that will be generating oil. So that complex 
that I showed you. Now, this is a carbonic dildo. Do we believe her? Do you believe me? So we don't, we don't, we didn't just stop there because we think this is such an extensive dildo and a complex with such huge potential that we actually had to do a bit more work. So we did a bit of de-reasoning from a Burgess and Tal paper. It's a shell paper. This is a shell out, oh, sorry, he might not be a shell employee, but he was a shell employee when he published his paper. He looked at a series of 20 factors in order to de-risk a buildup that we identify as a buildup on seismic. Why? Because when you see it on seismic, it can be anything. But when you look at all the different criteria, then you are de-risking that, that, that uh, buildup. We are looking at the relative timing. Are we in the right latitude? Yes. Do we have the framework builder type? Yes. Do we have uh, the right morphology? What are the geophysical characteristics? And what is the geometry? Here you look at positive elements, we'll give you a one. If you have negative elements, you get a minus one. Out of a possible 20 maximum score, we got 16. There is There are people from Shell here, and they can, um, they can probably tell me that I have said something wrong. But what I understand is that Shell will actually drill anything that scores over 15. And I don't, you've probably heard of the Sunbird discovery in Kenya. And my understanding is that that scored over 15. They drilled it, and it was a discovery, and it was definitely a carbonate buildup. So I think we have a carbonate buildup here. I'm pretty confident of that. And what are the resources? So again, as Neil said, because I've worked in resource estimation for oil companies, we didn't just take this lightly. This is a very serious exercise. We have huge uncertainty here. So how do we evaluate when we have uncertainty? We do a probabilistic evaluation, because if we do deterministic, we're gonna come up with unrealistic, huge numbers. Doing this probabilistic um, evaluation, log normal distributions for area, and metric and porosity, and using very, very wide um, uncertainty values, because we have a lot of uncertainty Look at what we get in the mean. And for those of you who work with probabilistic distributions, if this is a well done exercise, then most of the time you will be achieving the mean. And look at what we have. We have a billion barrels of oil in place for this particular buildup. This is part of a much bigger complex. I'm only showing you the buildup here. A huge, huge potential. Now I'm going to move to the south. Look at that same source rock in the south. It's where it says S, and you have this sort of a brown sequence shown on there. Again, we've got that low frequency. We have done the source rock characterization, so we believe that, that is the source rock. And you see that it's um, right under this very interesting feature. <coughs> At first, we were very puzzled with that feature. But when we analyzed it further again, <coughs> This seems to be a carbonate platform in the Cretaceous. So a bit of a different age. And again, look at what's overlying it. This sort of opaque sequence that should act as a seal. So we carried out, now that you know that our source of has been de-risked. And oh, before I move on to the evaluation of that particular play, I want to show you that we also looked at some <coughs> younger source rocks. Here we have more sediment overburden in the south. So some of those younger source rocks should be generating hydrocarbons and are potentially in the oil window. And here we have uh, the Lake Cretaceous pull apart basin. Look at the map. I didn't show you this map before, but just to show you that we did take into account the plate tectonic reconstructions. Look at what India does. When at this time, India rotates anti clockwise and actually it has this like a small collision with Africa, I mean, not quite a collision, but that gives you a lot of compressional um, deformation, which is what we believe has caused a lot of these anticlines, but also has given us this restrictive basis where you have source rock deposited. So this is a great um, setting, a bit of a surprise to us when we reconstructed, we understood it better, but in these settings, in this small restrictive basis, we see the source rock deposition. And as we move up, in the sequence we see at the base of this gravity-driven linked um, compressional, extensional compressional systems, at the base of the tow thrust, you'll see the decomal surfaces, and we have interpreted those to be also source rocks. That's debatable, but it's also a very common thing. So that could be a potential source rock, and we see what's happening in terms of the latent 
coming through construction as India is moving away from Africa. So more source rocks. And again, we have done the basin modeling together with Leeds. Look at the early post drift and the early Cretaceous, and both of those source rocks are generating, again, it's green. They're generating mainly oil here in the southern basin. This is why what Neil was saying, Somalia is about oil. If you have small pockets of gas here and there, or gas and condensate, they will be very small. This <coughs> is an oil problem. And I think a lot of oil industry players suspected that, but we can confirm that our modeling tells us that this is going to be oil. So as I promised, we looked at that complex. This is again a very large complex. And it's got a, an area of about 6,500 square kilometers. And when you do again your probabilistic resource estimation, because then you're taking into account your full uncertainty range, you get about 2.3 billion barrels of oil in the mean. And that is your most likely outcome when you drill through this complex. So that's for the carbonate lovers. I will, um, I will describe some plastic prospects as well for those who are more uh, on the plastic side. There is something for everyone here. There is some, some, something for everyone's face. But as, I, as I said at the beginning, when you're looking at source rock, if you think your source rock is generating oil, well, where is the evidence for oil, you may be asking. So first I'm going to tell you just a little bit of a side note, because I worked as Neil said, with some national oil companies, including Pemex. And so what you see there on the left is a picture of just what? The oil seeps that are above the Cantorell oil field. You probably know the Cantorell oil field. It's the second largest oil field in play, with 35 billion barrels of oil in place. And look at the seeps above the oil field. That's because there are so many fractures. But what seeps tell us is that there is a working petroleum system. This is a huge accumulation. It doesn't tell us that it's leaking. It tells us there's oil being generated. Now look at the Scarborough field in the Carbacker Basin in the northwest shelf of Australia, a 7 TCF accumulation with hundreds of fluid pipes and hundreds of pockmarks on the surface. And yet it's a huge accumulation. So what it tells us is there is oil in the system, it's an active there is hydrocarbon in the system as well. So we looked for this mix. We looked for this oil's mix from our optical satellite USGS database. And here you can see examples of these oil seeds. We link them to the subsurface when we found repeated high confidence oil slicks. We link them to the subsurface data. And look at that beautiful fluid pipe which ends right where the slick is. So that is excellent evidence. Very Firm, strong evidence that we are generating oil present day. And we can see it on the seismic as well. And here's another nice example. I've been talking about the Sindrift Tab Brown. This one really surprised us because, first of all, it's a beautiful slick. And you don't get much better than that. <coughs> but look at where it's located. It's actually located here. You've got these two very thick Sindrift Tab Browns in blue. And on the edge, of the cinder tap problem, all the black dots are slicks. What this is indicating to us is that the cinder tap problems are actually full of, well, the source rock is actually generating oil and it's seeping through the surface right at the edge. Very good evidence, and that's exactly what we look for. And look at some of the amplitude anomalies as well associated with that. This is probably one of the best pieces of evidence. Look at the pock marks, the fluid pipe. And at the end of this line, not exactly over the pop mark, but at the end of this line, you get the repeated oil slicks. And then we've got shallow amplitude anomalies. We do have flat spots. We do see PHIs as well. And that's an example. And actually, one of the lines that I showed, where I showed you the carbonate platform, in the inboard anticline, there was a very clear PHI. So before I move on to just summarizing, I just want to. Um, show you that I've, we've identified several play types and we have mapped the play fairways of these several play types. And what you see on the left is a map showing the geological basin and also showing the polygons 
of the play fairway. So you'll see there, for example, purple indicating the play fairway of the same rift path gravens. In blue, you'll see some of the carbonate complexes, some of the inward anticline uh, trend, outward anticline trend. And what we believe, even though we don't have any data, we strongly believe that this actually extends into pond length. And so that's why we've been designing and we are promoting, together with the ministry, a survey offshore pond length, because we believe that this prospectivity extends out there. And it's just a matter of imaging it, like we have imaged the prospectivity in the southern portion. So the prospectivity does extend into pond length. So as a summary, well, kind of a conclusion really, because as I said, we have identified many different play types. And here's a summary of the main play types we have identified. The top one on the left is that carbonate complex. If you look at the whole complex, it's about six and a half million barrels of oil in place of potential. The second most important, or the second with the biggest potential, is this Cretaceous carbonate complex. That is about two and a half billion barrels of oil potential. When we look at the tilted fault blocks, because I showed you some tilted fault blocks, we have over 200 leads. 10 of those have more than half a million, half a billion barrels of oil in place. And you can see an example there of the tilted fault blocks. Then we go to, that, to the near shore anticlines. Some of those have flat spots. They are huge again. We have over 60 of those leads. And again, they go up to a half billion barrels of oil in place. You're probably doing the math, so you can, you can do the math to see if you come up with the same numbers that we came up with. We've got the toll trust. We've got both tertiary and Cretaceous toll trust. And when you look at the actual toll trust, the, the potential within the toll trust, because we've mapped all those leads, it's about a, over 100 leads, and they, they have about 0.2 billion barrels of oil in place. We have um, the outboard anticline. So these were the transpersonal anticlines from the transition of India when it rotates anti-clockwise. And that over 30 of those with about 0.4 billion barrels of oil in place. And then beneath the breakup on conformity, we have mapped the anticlines associated with the breakup on conformity. We've got over 40 leads and they go up to 0.6 billion barrels of oil in place. There's a map there, and all the colors that you see there, all the polygons, and some of those are very big here, you're probably realizing. If you can see them, they are huge. Inboard, outboard, shallow water, deep water, all along the margin, covering all the states. There is a widespread distribution of all these play types. There isn't <coughs> one state that doesn't have a lot of productivity. There isn't one block that doesn't have the prospectivity in it. For that reason, and in summary, these are the blocks, the most prospective <coughs> blocks that we have identified, and I have shown you we have done very, very detailed, thorough evaluation of the resources of the play types. And we have come up with the most prospective blocks. Those are the blocks that will be offered in the round and you have seen that this is very strongly supported with our very successful seismic identification of possible source rocks, our basin modeling showing you that it's producing oil, the evidence from slicks and DHIs that there is hydrocarbon being generated in the system. And if you did the maths, 